All right, so the last in our series on prophecy is uh, pending. You know, what God said uh, is yet to happen. We've gone through this, uh, gone down this path basically of uh, seeing God speak uh, hundreds and even thousands of years in advance in detail about events that are going to happen in the future and uh, how these things work surrounding Jesus in general, his birth, his ministry, um, uh, specifically the, the year of his death in Daniel 9, uh, the prophecies about Jesus being the suffering servant, uh, the two comings of, of um, the Messiah, the regathering of Israel, and it's meant to be sort of this systematic um, teaching, you have this foundation of the reliability of scriptures, and then each layer that you put on there uh, kind of serves this point at the end where we take a look at where we're at right now and what God has said is going to come that has not yet happened. Because he has a perfect track record. Up to this point, he's 100%. And so there's no reason for us to doubt the things that are going to happen, that he said is going to happen. Uh, we can pretty much count on them that they're going to happen. So uh, we're going to look at uh, a handful of pending prophecies. So here's our text that we have gone to over and over, Isaiah 44, 6 through 8. This is what the Lord says, Israel's King and Redeemer, the Lord Almighty. I am the first and I am the last. Apart from me there is no God. Who then is like me, let him proclaim it. Let him declare and lay out before me what has happened since I established my ancient people and what is yet to come. Yes, let them foretell what will come. Do not tremble, do not be afraid. Did I not proclaim this and foretell it long ago? You are my witnesses. Is there any God besides me? No. There is no other rock. I know not one. All right, so when we talk about pending prophecies, the uh, kind of the, the theologian language that they use around it is the word eschatology, which just basically means the study uh, or the science of studying end times. Um, yeah, the, the study of end times, especially as it relates to the Bible. So here's a handful of the things that uh, go into eschatology. We talk about tribulation, widespread confusion, apostasy in the church, the second coming, rapture, antichrist, the beast, kings of the north, kings of the south, kings of the east, signs in the sky, abomination of desolations, new Jerusalem, rebuilding of the temple, earthquakes, one world government, one world currency, globalization, men killed by fire, ten nations, seven hills, widespread famine, widespread pestilence, widespread persecution of Christians, beam of judgment, white throne judgment, Jewish revival, millennial reign, new heaven, new earth, and voting for Pedro <laughs> so all your wildest dreams can come true. So what we're going to do, we're going to be here till 4 o'clock in the morning, and we're going to spend a half hour talking about every single one of these because you guys got to know about uh, the seven hills and the ten nations that we talked about in the end time. So not really. We're not really going to do that. Basically, what I'm going to do is uh, we're going to talk about how the planet is being staged and how the conditions and the need for globalization are being established and what I believe are the driving forces behind it. Uh, as Christians, we live in light of these times. The call of Christ is to be ready with the understanding that he has also prophesied a time that all Christians will account for our lives lived after salvation. And then if we want to take questions, we, we can. So kind of the first part, talking about uh, this conditions and need for globalization, and, um, and then Christ's instruction to us when we recognize that uh, we are in these times, he says you got to be ready. And... And so, actually, out of all of these teachings that we've had, this is probably going to be the most practical. Uh, 
out of probably all the teachings, it, it has, I've gotten the most positive um, kind of feedback on this one because the second half of this is just very practical. It's like, this is what it looks like to be ready. This is what it looks like to earn re uh, rewards in heaven according to the New Testament. Okay, how, how to be ready. So, uh, before we do that, I want to look at, this is a text from Revelation 13. It's sort of in the heart of the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is written by the Apostle John when he's on the island of Patmos. And uh, God basically just gives him these incredible visions of what's going to happen. And uh, you're also going to recognize some language here that's there's a lot of symbolism. Uh, it's not like God says, the, there's going to be an antichrist and he is going to come from this country here. Um, they used general directions, uh, kind of the, the language really lends itself to ambiguity. And because of that, there are a lot of different interpretations of, of these passages. And uh, I tend to want to emphasize the humility that we need as Christians to read these things, to do our best to understand them, but um, the be ready part that Jesus has told us uh, is more important than us figuring out all of the little um, jots and tittles of revelations. So uh, with that said, uh, would somebody please read this for us out loud? Can everybody see it? I will. Okay, read nice and loud so Bill can hear us. Hi, honey. And I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads, with ten diadems on its horns and blasphemous names on its heads. And the beast that I saw was like <clears throat> a leopard. Its feet were like a bear's. <clears throat> and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And to it the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority. One of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound but its mortal wound was healed, and the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. Pause for just a second. Uh, the couple of things we want to point out in here, the dragon we know is Satan. All right? Uh, there is this um, one who Satan gives the power to that gets a mortal wound on its head. Uh, it looks like this person's going to die, but they don't. And then for our sake tonight, when we're talking about globalization, we're talking about kind of one earth governing body, uh, we're going to recognize that in conjunction with this person that this dragon has given all this authority to, the whole earth, right, marvels as they follow the beast. All right, so kind of look for that uh, global encompassing language, whole earth, as she continues to read. And they worshipped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who can fight against it? And the beast was given a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority for forty-two months. It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. <clears throat> also, it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them and authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation. And all who dwell on the earth will worship it, everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. Okay. So, again, just this, uh, starting in verse 8, and all who dwell on the earth will worship it, right? This uh, globalization of the earth coming under this leader and worshiping them. Um, the reference there to the Lamb's Book of Life. And then this is from, actually this would be Revelation 14. That was Revelation, or was, yeah, sorry. This would be Revelation 14, not Revelation 13. Uh, I'll read this. It says, Then I saw another beast rising out of the earth. It exercises all the authority of the first beast, um, in its presence and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed 
It performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people. And by the signs that it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on the earth, telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. And it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast, so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. Also, it causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead, so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark. That is the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it's the number of a man, and his number is 666. I apologize. This is Revelations 13. Now, Revelations 14, 9 through 11. And another angel, a third, followed them, saying, with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and its image and, received it, and receives a mark on his forehead or his hand, he also will drink the wine of God's wrath, poured full of strength into the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest, day or night. These worshipers of the beast and its image, and whoever receives the mark of its name. So that's very strong, pretty vivid uh, language and imagery about some stuff that's going to be happening. Okay, this, this will eventually happen on the face of the earth. And, and I wanted to put this out because uh, I think some, some of us never read this. And some of us never press into the book of Revelation for various different reasons. And this is a pretty good sample of what... Uh, a prophetic text looks like from the Bible, uh, especially around pending prophecies. And the other thing, just as a little caveat, uh, unless, I mean, all of us here have descendants, right? We have children, um, probably going to have grandchildren. At some point, someone in our families, unless the rapture happens, you know, we get taken out of here before any of this stuff goes on, they're going to face these kinds of things. Okay. And uh, I found that one of my primary roles as a father is to equip my children for the future. And as Christians, we should be making our children aware that um, these kinds of things are going to be happening. This is, uh, practically, this is a done deal. Even though it hasn't happened yet, it will happen. All right? And God's very clear about the taking of the number of this beast and worshiping this beast or its image, right? Uh, the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. They have no rest day or night. These worshipers of the beast and its image and whoever receives the mark of its name, okay? So we want to be very clear with our children and the people who are around us. This is a big deal, okay? This is all-encompassing uh, things that are going to be happening. So... Uh, what I'm going to do is is basically, ultimately, I think the purpose of this sermon, uh, for a lot of people, I think we are, sometimes we get sort of like tunnel vision in our lives. You know, I'm accomplishing what I'm ac accomplishing. I have my family. We have recitals and plays and, and sports and, you know, we're doing all of our stuff and we sometimes we need God to kind of whack our blinders a little bit. Say, hey, look, you need to look around here. Okay, and um, there's, we are much further uh, along here than you know. And Jesus himself said, uh, it, you know, when things are going down, everybody's just going to be, it's going to be business as usual for everybody. They're just going to be doing their thing. And, um, you know, He's going to come like a thief in the night. So, um, what I want to do is talk about globalization. Uh, globalization refers to the increasing integration of economies around the world, 
particularly through trade and financial flows. It also refers to the movement of people and labor and knowledge through technology across international borders. So there's four basic main areas that globalization is happened. Um, the one we're going to talk about tonight is ecology. I'll spend some time talking about uh, the condition and the need for globalization uh, from an ecological standpoint. In media and entertainment, we already see this, right? I mean, uh, people knew about the overthrow of that leader in Egypt because it was posted on Facebook before they knew it on the news, right? I mean, it's, it's information and uh, through media and entertainment, in, information and technology, it's like we're global, right? Um, when movies release in the U.S., you know, I don't, I don't know what the lag time is before they release in another country, but just like, just like stars in in film and entertainment will go to a press release, they do that all over the world, right? It's just, it's just a matter of time before they get there, and and so as far as media and entertainment go, there are no borders. Okay, it doesn't matter whether it's in uh, China or it's in you know di different lands. They don't recognize borders. None of these things really recognize national borders. Economy and business. When I've taught this before, I did this whole piece on the globalization of uh, economy and business. It's it's pretty in depth, and it makes this talk about an hour and twenty minutes long. So I nixed that, but basically uh, what we would need to know about economy and business is that uh, there are more, uh, of, the, of the top 100 wealthiest entities in the world, 50 of them are no longer countries, but businesses, okay? And uh, at no other time in history has there been men in these places of extreme uh, economic and um, business influence to where they can actually have a vision and see how the entire globe could be integrated under one economic whole? Uh, they call them multinational companies, MNCs, and, uh, or multinational corporations. And they just talk about just like your iPhone, right? It, all of the different nations uh, that are represented in an iPhone, uh, from the glass to where this processor is made, that piece of plastic's made, it's like, you know, there might be a half a dozen different countries that are involved in your one phone. And, and so uh, there's just, the, the world is exploding with these corporations, and they don't care whether you're at war uh, with that country, they still do business. I don't care whether uh, there's sex trafficking going on there or there's, any, they still do business in those countries. Okay, so they don't recognize borders or boundaries. They cross them. They're, they're non-existent in economy and business. And, and like I referred to information and technology again, uh, with the World Wide Web being what it is, and the number of people who blog and can get information out there, it, it again, doesn't recognize borders or boundaries. They, uh, there, there are some places like North Korea that do their best to try to uh, keep their people from getting information from other uh, nations and from places outside of their borders. But even at that, it's, it's a, they will fail. They fail at their attempt to do that. The information gets there. Um, this definition for globalization comes off of the website for the International Monetary Fund. Anybody ever heard of the International Monetary Fund? You have? Okay. What do you know about it? Not much. Not much. Okay. Um, I thought it was interesting because the, you know, the, the scripture talks so much about uh, globalization needing to happen in order for all of the world to come under this one leader, the whole world worship them and stuff. And just to recognize that, that um, 
you know, world powers, it's almost like they're kind of, it's not like they're oblivious to it or they're apathetic. It's just, this is what's happening. It's globalization. And um, International Monetary Fund's a pretty good website to go to to get some information if you want to see how the world's economic powers pool their resources to help the world. Uh, and um, it's kind of, kind of interesting how they do that when you look into it. The thing that drives globalization as far as e ecology is concerned is the world population. So as best as we can through, you know, um, discerning history and the histories of the peoples that we know, uh, they've tracked population growth uh, for about the last 4,000 years. And, you know, the, the further we've got down this road, obviously we've gotten more and more accurate. But what I want us to recognize, no matter how old you think humanity is or the earth is, most people believe that humanity as we know it is less than 10,000 years old. Okay, so, um, so we would say it, it took 10,000 years on the face of the earth till 1830 for us to get to 1 billion people on the face of the earth. Okay, so that's a long time, right? Um, and, the, and then what we recognize from there is that the, the world population has gone exponential, right? So 1960, we're over 3 billion. So 100, it's 10,000 years to here, 130 years, and it's already tripled, okay? Um, up to basically the year 2000 when you're sitting over 6 billion people on the face of the earth. So from 1830 to the year 2000, right, you got uh, 170 years. Um, that we went from 1 billion to over 6 billion people on the face of the earth. They project that by the year 2050, we'll have over 9 billion people on the face of the earth. That's a lot. Uh, God numbered all the hairs on all their heads. So, most, um, of most of them are in New York, right? Um, this is something, I, I don't know how you guys think about this. Uh, a billion is a huge number. I mean, it's it's... To me, we're getting outside of like reasonably comprehending that kind of a number, right? I can I can do the math on it, but a billion people, I can. There's times just here in Kansas City during rush hour. Uh, I remember one time I was stuck on the bridge. This was before they did the construction uh, on 69 Highway over the top of 435. There was like it was like the wreck Friday afternoon, and Traffic was stopped in both directions on 69 Highway and both directions on 435. And as far as I could see in every direction were cars. And I was just blown away at how many, and then how many people was there. And then I began to, okay, this is just one little part of our city. And this is just one little city in, uh, in the United States that's made up of hundreds of these cities and then globally speaking the United States is very small in the population we're, we're hardly a blip right um, and and so this is a staggering amount of people on the face of the earth and uh, this this graph here alone is one that when I see that my heart races a little bit okay because 10,000 years to get to 1 billion and 170 years, we're up over six. That's amazing growth. It's unprecedented. All right, here's, here's where we start to get into uh, the ecological uh, issue driving globalization. Okay? Uh, so the work cited there is on the top. Humankind faces an unprecedented array of truly global and regional environmental problems the reach of which is greater than any single national community or generation. Uh, it's greater than any single national community and the solutions to which cannot be tackled at the level of the nation state alone. So what basically what these guys are recognizing is that due to the, glo the world population, the issues that are coming up because of it 
not one nation can answer the problem. It has to be a co-op of the nations. Okay? And it doesn't just have to be a co-op of the nations, but the generations that are leading the nations. So there's, there's a lot packed into there. Over the 20th century, these transformations have been paralleled by the unprecedented growth of global and regional environmental movements, regimes, and international treaties. However, none of these institutes, in, institutions has as yet been able to amass sufficient political power, domestic support, or international authority to do more than limit the worst excesses of some of these global environmental threats. Okay? So, what he's saying, if you look into this, now these people aren't Christians, right? They're just, they're just uh, you know, um, scientists who, who are looking into these things. But what he's saying is that none of these uh, regimes, uh, none of these things that have been able to amass sufficient political power, so what we need is more political power, right? Domestic support or international authority, right? So um, we have to basically surpass the domestic level and institute an international authority that can come in and enforce uh, some kind of uh, treaties or environmental causes that um, can help uh, correct these environmental threats that are happening. So they're calling for somebody like a big brother to step in here and do this. Um, this is where this takes on a, a real issue is when we talk about food production. All right, The amount of irrigated land around the world has not significantly increased since 1992. And erosion, the salinization of fields, and other forms of desertification are taking millions of acres out of production each year. Okay, so we're, we're building something here. We're going somewhere. In 2008, the Earth's total biocapacity. Anybody ever heard the word biocapacity before? What, do we got a pillow? I'm going to throw it at you if you go to sleep. Give me this. Sleep. All right. Um, but the Earth's biocapacity. All right. So basically what that phrase means is that the Earth has the ability to produce enough food and absorb enough waste for a certain number of people okay they've measured this around the earth they've fish in the ocean all this sorts of thing okay the earth's biocapacity was 12 billion global hectares or 1.8 global hectares per person okay while humanity's ecological footprint was 18.2 billion ghas or 2.7 GHAs per person. Okay, so there's a huge problem here. Okay, if you recognize what's going on here, this uh, 12 billion is what the Earth has. Okay, according to our population, we're using 18.2 billion. Okay, they call that an ecological overshoot. We'll look at that in just a second. Um, according to the the population in 2008, the Earth uh, a global hectare, so basically what they do is they measure how much land it takes to sustain Jeff's life and to absorb the waste that you produce. And I think they only measured um, how it's just one form of like uh, a, a gas um, from like the using, um, uh, you know, burning fossil fuels, that sort of thing. So that's what the earth has in its resources, okay? Um, what we use is 18.2 billions or 2.7 per person. This discrepancy means it would take one and a half years for the earth to fully regenerate the renewable resources that people use in a given year, all right? Now, part of this uh, 1.8, they also recognize that land has to rest. Okay, so uh, if Jeff needs three acres of land, maybe a third of one of those acres, they don't do anything with every year. Okay, and then the next year they'll plant something there and let another third rest. Okay, so this is a responsible number. 
Okay, we have overshot this uh, in in a great way. The other way I like to think about this, um, it takes a year and a half to for the Earth to regenerate what we use in a year. So, if I had inherited, uh, let's say I make fifty thousand dollars a year, and I inherited a hundred thousand dollars. The first year I inherited that hundred thousand dollars, I spent seventy five thousand instead of the fifty that I made, right? Then the next year I spent seventy five thousand. Okay, now I'm fifty into that hundred that I inherited. The next year I spent, you know, I, I'm I'm building a lifestyle based on a seventy five thousand dollar a year income. But here's the deal: that can only last. For four years. Year five rolls around and something's drastically going to have to change, right? But we're not talking about my lifestyle. We're talking about people's lives, okay? When this runs out, uh, people don't change their lifestyle. People die. People starve. That's what we're talking about. They call that the ecological overshoot. Humanity's annual demand on the natural world has exceeded what the earth can renew in a year since the 1970s. The ecological overshoot has continued to grow over the years, reaching a 50% deficit in 2008. This means that it takes a year and a half for the earth to regenerate the renewable resources that people use. The Living Planet Report, uh, I would anybody who wants to look into this, this is a, you can get this PDF online for free, very well documented, very well put together. All of these numbers come from it, okay? Uh, so you can, you can look into that yourself. In other words, humanity now exceeds the planet's capacities to sustain its consumption of renewable resources. We are able to maintain this global overdraft on a temporary basis by eating into the Earth's capital stocks of forests, fish, and fertile soils. Time is running out for us to change the way we live if we are to leave future generations a living planet. We knew it was bad, but until we did this report, we did not realize how bad it actually was. So what will we do, right? This, I believe, is going to be one of the major factors in driving globalization, especially uh, a, an authority is going to step in and, and you know we've got this problem where there's billions of people who are going without food and there's this kind of rise even up within the United States where we're doing all kinds of crazy stuff that doesn't make a whole lot of sense where people are going to start moving in this direction where we would gladly place ourselves under a great authority who would kind of help care for the distribution of the world's resources, right? And and do those kinds of things. And and so I, I believe that this is this is one of those four things sort of explained in a short uh, uh, bit here uh, that that I think is driving is creating the the need and the condition for globalization. Anybody have any thoughts on that? I know, I know what I find a lot is that, uh, honestly, within Christianity, uh, and especially around, our, we're, we're very Republican, and uh, Republicans hate this kind of talk. They think that's, that's right-wing, um, green movement stuff that we don't want to have anything to do with, right? And I, I, I hear what they're saying, I, I, you know, that... There, there's some wacky stuff out there, but I think the reality of this is I, I would be a fool to not recognize what's going on there, right? I think there's truth to that, but, you know, like so many times when we get these numbers thrown at us, we can go back and read these reports, but we don't really know who they are, what their biases are, what they're trying to get at. You know, there may be truth to these numbers. It also may be that they're wanting to put this out there because it does instill fear in everybody to think, okay, when this one world government pitch comes to us, well, we got to take it because these are the people that sell, sure. tell us everything's going to hell in a handbasket, so we've got to jump on board. Right, right. Um, you know, there may be truth, there may not be. Just like with the global warming, 
you know, the same type of thing. Right. There are scientists on both sides. So Right. This big, this is the coldest the year global. in recorded history and we're supposed to be going through global warming, right? Yeah. And I can remember back in the nineteen eighties, Time magazine, their covers were the coming ice age. Right. You know, so thirty years later, okay, we're we're done with the ice age and now we're gonna go to global warming. Right. Um, and you've got people on both sides of it, <clears throat> so you know maybe there's truth here, maybe there isn't. What is it based on? Right. And uh, what are they looking at? Uh, you know, how do they get their figures? And who are we to argue? You know, who has any scientific right. background? Right. That that, that right. begins. I, you know, uh, to be honest with you, I've only scratched maybe two layers below this this report. Okay. I can tell you the the person that I got the information from is. Um, a solid resource, uh, and and I think he is he's probably one of the most conservative people that I know in Christianity, uh, and so um, I like I said I I don't I don't know I know that you can go and kind of triangulate different resources. And say, what is the Earth's biocapacity? What do they mean by that? You know. Well, and I and, think. You know, from an academic standpoint, there's probably validity to it. And I'm going to use the word irrelevant. That may be a little strong. You know, perhaps the numbers are irrelevant. Um, from a scriptural standpoint, we're told to take care of the earth. Is that what we've done well? No, we haven't. Right. You know, should we actively recycle? You know, in my opinion, yes, we should. Should we actively conserve? Well, yes, we should, in my opinion. Right. Um, you know, when you look at population growth, Lisa and I were talking the other day about all the, the development going on mm -hmm. around the Kansas City area. And at what point do you consume, and after being in New York City, <laughs> you know, at what <laughs> yeah. point do you consume so much terrain to build residencies, apartments, single home, mm -hmm. whatever, that you lose production? Right. So there has to be a tipping point at some point. So I'm not arguing that there's right. not a concern. Right. I, I question the uh, panic, I guess, or the well, right. What should our response be? Yeah. Right. Right. And 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 I think that I think that part of I think I think it sh for as Christians, what we should do. I mean, one of the things that I talk to people about, is, you know, people who are storing up foods and grains and that sort of thing, it's like. Man, that I think uh, I think that's great. Are you going to eat and let your neighbor starve if there becomes a crisis where there's not food? Are you willing to do that? You know, um, same thing with guns and weapons, right? You you have to before you before you take that up, you've got to you've got as a Christian, you've got to be solid before God that there's a situation where the last face that person sees is yours before they see Jesus's. Right, so you need to you need to be sober minded about these kinds of things. I do think that, like you said, are the numbers irrelevant? I I I believe that part of what happens is happening is that this is the the globe being staged for exactly what the scriptures are talking about in a one world government. And I think this is one of those factors that's going to drive it. Uh, maybe even more so than any of the other three. Um, I, I, the, the money thing in finances and business, obviously, the whole world, nobody, I mean, when you, if you just take food and you take money, and you say, what nation wants to go without either one of them? Nobody does. All nations are trying to increase and sustain the, their own population uh, with funds and food, right? And so it, it definitely lends itself to, if you just step back and look at this, you're like, yeah, this really can only go one direction. Now, I don't know how long it's going to take to get there, but, I mean, we're not going to wake up tomorrow and the population is going to be half, right? It's going to continue to increase until, um, until something gives. So that, that really leads us um, okay, so the conditions and the need for globalization are present today as never before. The logic of one-worldism 
will soon be irresistible. Okay, um, you know, especially when you look at all of the the main factors. Uh, this global unity will be liable to take over by a great totalitarian ruler, and you couple this with other prophecies. We are we're much further down the prophetic timeline than we thought. I have I think I had one more here, and remember this is not outside of the hand of God. He has said this would happen. Okay, so when we when we take what we just heard and we we put it within the context of prophetic literature. And we've been looking at all of these prophecies that God had said, this is going to happen, and then it happens. And we even see the very natural way that these things unfold, especially around the life of Jesus. You could definitely see how this is a naturally occurring issue that very much lends itself to these things we read in Scripture that God said is going to happen. All right? So that, that leads us to the, the, the response that I think we should have. And it's not, do we wring our hands over it? I, I totally agree with, um, you know, I, we are the largest family on our neighborhood, and I like to put out the least amount of trash every week, mm -hmm. right? I'm really big on recycling. I'm really big on uh, the conservation of water and all the kinds of things that we can, right? Carpool. Um, all, I think those things are, are great things that we can do, but they're not going to keep this from happening, right? It's just good stewardship. And so uh, I do think that, that we should be good stewards of the earth. So Jesus tells us to be ready. So when I think about the, the, te the biblical teaching on being ready, uh, I, I think about it in terms of Jesus tells us on the front end, you need to be ready. You don't need to know the day or the hour. You just need to be ready for meeting me. And then Paul is going to say, okay, here's the other thing is when you die, um, God's going to give out rewards for how ready you were and how you made people ready. All right? And so we're going to look at those two passages of Scripture. Uh, this is um, Matthew 24. Jesus talking, he says, But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son of Man, but the Father only. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage, until the day when Noah entered the ark, and they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two men will be in the field, and one will be taken and one left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken and one left. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. You must be ready. That's Jesus' command. And then this is what Paul, how Paul talks about it uh, in Christian ministry. He says, According to the grace given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation, and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. For if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hair, straw, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. So what Paul is doing is he is painting a word picture. He's painting a, a picture in people's minds about the life they live that's built on Jesus Christ. Okay, At the end of Matthew 7, Jesus says, Whoever hears these teaching of mine and does them is like a guy who builds his house on the rock. Okay, 
And, uh, and here Paul is saying the foundation of your life is Jesus. Some people are going to build with things. Their lives are going to reflect things like gold and silver and precious stones. Some people, uh, their lives are going to be like, they're going to build with stuff like wood, hay, and straw. We would, we would call that sort of the American dream stuff. Uh, wood, hay, straw. Um, precious stones are what we're getting ready to look at on, on what, do, what is this reward and how do we accumulate it. What does that look like as far as the New Testament's concerned? Okay? Uh, he's, he's basically saying a fire is going to test these kinds of things. And obviously if it's wood, hay, or straw, it's just going to be burned up. It's going to count for nothing. Uh, I really like this account here because Paul isn't saying, look, if your life, if you give your whole life to wood, hair, and straw, you still make it, okay? You're going to be singed, right? You're just barely making it, but you're going to make it. And, but, but the hope is that people will recognize that, um, uh, man, I wish I would have thought about this before, but I, I've seen this analogy done where the, this guy has a piece of rope that is like super long, goes uh, from me through one room, through another room. You can't even see the end of it, right? And then at this end, there's a little bit of red tape, okay? It's like this little bit of red tape represents your life on earth. The rope represents your life for all eternity, okay? Okay? Um, wood, hair, straw would be like, live for everything that's on the tape, okay? Live for, you know, the flesh, pleasure, any, anything that doesn't have to do with um, eternity, right? And, but, but how much sense does that make for people to live that way? When your whole life goes on forever, why wouldn't you live in such a way that's going to benefit you for eternity, Instead of just having this little bit of reward here in this little section of tape at the end of this rope. And logically, we look like that would be ignorant, right? It's sort of like uh, if you know that, uh, you know, you're going you're gonna to go on one of these, like, uh, shows where you have to do a bunch of workout and exercise. And if you do really well, you're going to make a ton of money on, you know, you're going to do really well or something. And, and it's going to, it's six weeks from now. And it would be really foolish for me to sit around and eat donuts on my keister and do nothing for six weeks. You know, if you knew that that was coming, you'd be like, okay, no more donuts for the next six weeks. And I'm going to hit the gym, right? And I'm going to shed 20 pounds. And, and in six weeks, I can do a pretty fantastic turnaround and, and really do well for that event that takes place, right? But in the way God has set this up is the six weeks is basically it's your life. And um, what really matters is what's going to happen in the next one. And, and so that's how Paul is talking about this. That's how Paul is setting up your life in Christ, built on Christ. Uh, if you you can do these sorts of things that are going to benefit you for all eternity. So this is, this is what he says. So, so first of all, we look at what is the reward. Uh, commendation from God from 1 Corinthians 4, 5. He says, Therefore, do not go on passing judgment before the time, but wait until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the things hidden in the darkness and disclose the motives of men's hearts. And then... Each man's praise will come from uh, will come to him from God, right? And and basically he's creating this. Uh, you have an audience of one that you are working for here. It is God, and you live for Him. Okay, you you examine all of your life in light of one day I'm going to stand before Him, and there's going to be a first word out of His mouth to me okay get a vision for that right pray that god would give you a vision for the moment you stand before jesus what's the first words that he's going to say to you right As you i think what you do here 
over this period of time, it can make a huge difference, right? I, I know if I'm focused on that and I'm living for that, I start to long for that day. I'm, I long for it, that moment when I see my Lord. But just the opposite is true. If you don't really think about it, if you're not really working towards it, um, instead of longing for it, you start to dread it. You start to think, man, I really want more of this life. Or I'm really not ready to go see him. You know? And it's amazing how this, this thinking... It polarizes even our souls and our minds before the Lord. Uh, the, the other kinds of rewards that we think about uh, in the scriptures, not just in this place, but in other places, uh, this reference to uh, there is going to be some form of rulership in the coming kingdom. God talks about it. He talks about it with the, the 12 apostles. He talks about it. Uh, in parables and in different stories in, in the Gospels. This is one of them from Luke. Uh, it says, Well done, the king exclaimed. You're a good servant. You've been faithful with the little I entrusted to you. So you will be, you will be governor of ten cities as your reward. The next servant reported, Master, I've invested your money and made five times the original amount. Well done, the king said. You'll be governor over five cities. And uh, in a parallel passage, he's talking about when I come back in my kingdom, I'm going to give you the authority um, over these cities. And, and so we recognize that part of what goes on in this little stretch of life that we live now is going to echo for eternity. And um, we come face to face with Jesus and he gives st more stewardship based upon our stewardship here on earth. Okay, so how could we accumulate this reward? Now, here's the deal, is that I recognize that we live in a hyper-competitive society, and when we, when we hear the language, how can I accumulate reward, we start thinking in terms of, well, I can do better than her, and it can, it can be this sort of um, narcissistic, competitive, bleh, uh, and, and so I want to recognize that we have the propensity to go that way, but God doesn't avoid this. He didn't avoid saying, I'm going to give you accommodation when I see you in heaven. He didn't avoid saying, I'm going to give out stewardship responsibilities based upon your stewardship in this life. If God would have been silent in these areas, then so should we, right? But he wasn't silent. Just like he's not silent about accumulating rewards in heaven, neither should we be. We should just be spiritually minded about it and not carnally minded. Okay? So bringing people to Christ is a way in Scripture that we accumulate reward. Daniel 12, 3. And those who have insight will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse of heaven. And those who lead the many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Okay, uh, another text, 1 Thessalonians 2. For who is our hope or joy or crown of exaltation? Okay, crown, there's that language of reward in heaven. Paul says, is it not even you in the presence of Jesus at his coming? You are, the, you are our crown and our reward. Um, we have led many people to righteous. He says, for you are our glory and our joy. And so we recognize that uh, however God is going to work this out, that leading people uh, to the righteousness of God, leading people to be born again in Jesus Christ, is a, a perfect way to accumulate a reward in heaven. That, that that is something that you will get an attaboy, a commendation from God. We can help people grow in Christ. I really like this one because this is obviously one of my passions. Uh, Peter says, Shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God, and not for sordid gain, but with eagerness, nor yet as lording it over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. 
So in the way you shepherd the people who are around you, right? This is a, an extremely foreign concept to Western Christianity because we almost eternally see ourselves as not shepherding anybody else. We're, we're, we, we're consumers. The, that's the way Western Christianity is set up. You come and you take of the goods that the church offers and we say things like, that really ministered to me today. We say things like, um, well, you know what, that person, I just don't get fed when I'm around that person. And, and that's okay, I think, if you're in year one or two or four of your Christian walk. But if you're still saying that 20 years, 10 years down the road, I think the New Testament would say, well, no duh. That's because you're supposed to be feeding people. <laughs> you're supposed to be the one who recognize God has shepherded you and you look for people that you can shepherd and that you can serve with your own life and you can be an example to them. So a lot of the New Testament doesn't make sense or is not applicable to Western Christianity and it's very difficult to accumulate rewards from like Heartland Community Church used to have this phrase, the blue seeders. That just meant the people who came to receive. You don't you're not accumulating no rewards from the blue seed. And, and so God doesn't want us to stay there. He, he calls every person to ministry. Every single person. He doesn't call leaders uh, to do the ministry, but to equip the saints to do the ministry. And, and, and so every Christian is a minister. And, and the more you press into that and uh, how you do that before the Lord... It accumulates reward in heaven. Um, undergo training. I, I like this too, right? Uh, how can you accumulate? According to 1 Corinthians 9, uh, Paul says, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? So you need to run in such a way that you may win. And everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. Then they do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. Therefore, I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air, but I buffet my body and I make it my slave. Lest possibly, after I have preached to others, I myself should be disqualified. So he's likening a Christian's life to a person who competes in the Olympics. And um, as far as Olympic training goes, right, this ain't making it, okay? He's saying those guys, they, they work out, right? They, they got everything down to a perfect T, but they're doing it for, an imper or for a perishable wreath. He's saying, Christian, you should think of your life in even greater terms than Olympians do their physical life. Your spiritual life, because you're working for an imperishable crown. You're working for something that doesn't fade away. And then, and then I, I like how Paul describes it. So I run in such a way as not with that aim. When I get up in the morning, I know what my aim is. I know what I'm headed towards. I don't just kind of, well, if this happens or if that happens or, you know, if the planets align, you know, that might happen. He's like, no way. No way I am purposed in everything I do. Just like an Olympic athlete would be. You know, the way they eat, how they train, all that. It's like, I am purposed in my spiritual life. Uh, and I make my, my body basically submit to my spirit. So that after I preach to people, I don't end up falling into sin and disqualify every gospel message I've ever preached. Uh, endure suffering. Blessed is a man who perseveres under trial. For once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life with which the Lord has promised to those who love him. So I can promise every person that takes this very seriously, that says, okay, I, I am going to figure out ways to take my focus off of this life and put it on the next one, you're going to go through some trials. And... and and so know it's going to happen. So when it does, 
you can persevere. And he doesn't just say, that's your life, get over it. He's like, no, you persevere because there's going to be a, an unfading crown, the crown of life on the other end of this thing. Uh, also, giving money and material resources to advance God's work. It says, instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is life indeed. Okay, so uh, sometimes we think about this in terms of like a missions work, right? Uh, a missionary goes, but he's got to have some financial backing. So the people who give to that missionary share in all of the work that that missionary does. Okay. I think about that in terms of our own launch, that uh, whether Rick and Christy are are uh, preaching the gospel or they're out doing all the things that I'm trying to, to do in the ministry God's called me to do, because they are financially supportive of the ministry, they are laying a foundation. They're storing up a treasure with every dollar that they give for heaven. Okay? And they're participating in all of the ministry that's going on by their involvement there. And so we should, uh, I think you contrast that with the legal uh, the legalism that says, um, well, are you giving on your gross or your net? It's like, really? You guys want to have that conversation? How about if we have this conversation? Okay. Uh, amen? Amen. Okay. So, uh, how should hoping for this judgment affect us? We're almost done here. We should persevere in ministry. Uh, I solemnly charge in the presence of God and of Christ, who is the judge of the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, fulfill your ministry. In the future, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Um, I've never... I've never had to go to court and um, had my life examined for for serious crime where there was a judgment and a gavel that had to fall. But I, I've watched a few decent movies on that, and I've I've you know the, the when the gavel drops and it's in your favor, that's an amazing an amazing thing, and and God paints that picture for us that that. He is this judge and that he is going to award people uh, who persevere in their ministries. Because here, I mean, again, here's the deal. I, I had no idea how hard ministry was, right? I had no clue how, I mean, you, you would be surprised that the high highs and the low lows in ministry in a, in a given week or in a season of life. I mean, it is unbelievable, and, and I always just go back to this reality that, man, I, I'm ruined for anything else. It's like, this is it. This is my life. Uh, persevere in ministry. Uh, so we should invest every day of our lives in eternity. This, may, this is definitely one of my all-time favorite passages in all of Scripture. It says, uh, in Isaiah 55, it says, Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread? and your labor for that which does not satisfy. So he's saying, in this period of life that you're living, why would you live for anything that doesn't count for eternity? Why would you, why would you do that? This doesn't make sense. He says, listen diligently to me and eat what is good, and delight yourself in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear that your soul may live. And I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. So I just, I love that, um, that image of wasteful life versus coming to God and having all of your life count. Last slide. Uh, when we think about pending prophecies, what's going on, the stage being set, uh, we have to recognize that history is ramping up at a rapid pace. This thing is going to close out 
um, without a, a lot of people even recognizing. We recognize that the condition and the need are in place like no time in history for the conclusions God has prophesied for the world to take place. And God has called us to be ready. And he will give those who embrace that call eternal rewards. So, does anybody have any questions about the teaching, thoughts, any conclusions that you would um, make? I'm, I'm turning off the YouTube thing right now. It just takes a second. Would you see...